Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series. I'm Eric Weisbard, one of the organizers, along with uh, Gus Stadler, Carl Wilson, Kimberly Mack, and Francesca Royster. Um, this series comes together um, with a few sponsoring organizations, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, the Pop Conference, and IASPM US. Um, we have been going for almost three years now, and uh, back episodes of the series are available on my YouTube channel. Next week in the series, we have um, a book on King Curtis, the legendary jazz saxophonist, um, and a book on, um, um, and the author of that book, whose name for some sad reason is momentarily escaping me, but it's going to come back, um, um, is in conversation with R.J. Smith, the author of a great biography of Chuck Berry. Um, so that's next week, but for now, for today, we are in Leeds talking punk, art school, and why those things aren't necessarily as seamless a blend as earlier accounts may have led you to believe. So we have author Gavin Butt, uh, author of the book No Machos or Pop Stars, When the Leeds Art Experiment Went Punk, in conversation with Ben Highmore. Um, just to quickly read you a little bit about the, uh, these two gentlemen and then turn it over to them. Uh, Gavin Butt is, Butt is interested in how the social worlds and aesthetic preoccupations of visual artists can be connected, sometimes in surprising ways to those within popular music, queer culture, and performance. He's currently researching a related volume to No Machos or Pop Stars, which will tell the hitherto untold story of the roots of US pop, rock, and disco performers in the art and theater milieu of the 1970s queer underground. I guess that's not an illicit thing for people to know then. He is professor of fine art at Northumbria University in Newcastle, and he'll be talking today with Ben Highmore, who teaches cultural studies at the University of Sussex. His most recent book, Lifestyle Revolution, How Taste Changed Class in Late 20th Century Britain, is coming out on Manchester University Press more or less tomorrow, we're told. Um, and then uh, looking ahead, he's currently writing a book about post-1945 experimental playgrounds. Uh, he very occasionally writes about popular music, but he listens to it incessantly. And we were told in their bios to remember that Buttenheimer are both products of the UK art school system, whose relationship to pop and punk will very much be our topic for today. Um, one last um, item of business. We always encourage people who are attending the session live to put all their comments the minute they think of something in the chat. We share that text with our presenters after the fact. If your comment is in the form of a question, like for example, it has a question mark at the end of it. Um, Gus Stadler, who is uh, running the Q&A today, will call on you at the end. We also ask Gavin and Ben not to look in the chat because it will look back at you and you will be distracted. We'll feel that afterwards. All right. With all those little preliminary notes, I turn it over to Ben. Thank you both for joining us. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, it's really good to be here. It's um... 10 o'clock in the evening over here and um, wine hasn't yet been drunk but um so we're here to talk about uh, gavin's book no machos or pop stars when the leeds art experiment went punk um i met gavin at leeds in 1989 so we've known each other for a long time we have a kind of similar kind of intellectual trajectory and what i'm going to do is i'm going to get Gavin to uh, spill some information about the book to begin with, but then hopefully it will just turn organically into a conversation between us and we'll talk for about 40, 45 minutes and then open it up for, for questions. So Gavin, this lovely book you've written, um, can you just set the scene a bit for us? You know, what, where did it come from? What, what kind of a book is it? I guess the origins of the book are probably about mm, 10 years in the past now, um, when uh, changes were happening to the UK higher education system by the then condemned government, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats who were uh, in power in, in 2010 when they summarily decided to triple university fees overnight. And um, 
Uh, not long after that, I was made a professor uh, and I got to thinking uh, whether or not I was a, a dying breed, uh, whether or not uh, there would be many other people in the future uh, who came from a background uh, similar to mine, a working class background. I grew up in, in Derbyshire, in the East Midlands, the English East Midlands. Um, and I went on to uh, to art school, to Goldsmiths, uh, actually, in London uh, in, the, in the late 80s and, uh, and ended up uh, an academic uh, in, in the UK system today. And I wondered whether or not that kind of trajectory from a working class um, upbringing into the professoriate, let's say, um, was going to be possible in future, given the, the high level of fees um, that were being introduced and the high levels of debt that students are a graduating university from uh, and perhaps uh, even if they if even if working class kids were going to go to university the chances of them actually studying fine art studying a degree in the creative arts probably looked less likely so all of that got me thinking backwards retrospectively to to the system that allowed me to to do what i what i did um, uh, and even before that, actually, and to think about why I wanted to go to art college in the first place. And in part, it's because I was a massive fan of the Three Johns, uh, the late uh, period post-punk outfit that came from Leeds. Um, and one of the reasons I, I loved that band so much in the mid 80s uh, was not only because I liked jumping around to their music, usually while drunk, but also that I knew that two of the Johns went to, to art school, to the fine art department at Leeds University. Uh, their artwork was on the cover, um, the covers of the, of the three Johns releases. And I knew about the art school connection from reading interviews with them in the NME, but they also the, the, the tutor, Terry Atkinson, the post-conceptual artist did a, an artwork for the, the initial uh, three Johns album release, uh, Atom Drum Bop. Um, and so I wanted to actually uh, assess, perhaps in, in a more in more granular detail than say Frith and Horn were able to in their still important but now quite old book, Art into Pop from 1987, I think that was published. Um, what it was about that connection, what was the significance of it, what was the impact of an art education from the system that we are now losing, or you, you might argue we have lost in the UK, what did it once allow to happen? Uh, what were the conditions of possibility, if you like, in the late 1970s uh, and in the early 80s, in Leeds specifically, that allowed for such an efflorescence of, uh, of popular music making by art students, not only at uh, the Leeds University Art Department, but also at the, at the, the kind of sister organization, if you like, the sister institution just down the road, as it were, in Leeds, Leeds Polytechnic, which also had a fine art department there. Um, so the bands that came out of the, these uh, two institutions, these two departments, a legion, uh, and the, what, they're what I write about in the book, Gang of Four, Mekons, Scritti Politti, Soft Cell, Delta Five, uh, Fad Gadget, um, Household Name, The Three Johns, um, Another Color, and many others. And I wanted to th therefore write a book about um, what was the role of, of an art school education in birthing or at least helping birth this very local uh, scene, but also with international reach and significance, and also perhaps ask why it's been so overlooked <laughs> in favour of, you guessed it, Manchester, uh, but other scenes like Liverpool, Sheffield, uh, London, of course, internationally. Uh, New York and, and, and Dusseldorf. So that's where it came from. It came from actually my grumblings about the transformation of the higher education sector today and wanting to look back in uh, history uh, to, uh, to, to kind of assess really what, we, what we've now lost uh, in, the, in the contemporary university system that we've got here in, in, in Brexit Britain. There's a real uh, kind of Benjaminian thing there, I think, that, that idea that, you know, a kind of moment of history, you know, like the massive fee uh, rise of uh, university uh, students um, kind of 
you, you know, throwing light, throwing kind of lightning bolt onto onto a kind of another another kind of moment of uh, moment in history. Okay, so you've you, so you so you're kind of going back to this moment, um, late seventies. It, it kind of finishes around kind of 81, 82, where you see a kind of crisis in 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 both kind of kind of UK education, but also in, in, in the art college. How did you how did you go about you know tracking that history, doing that historical work? Well, I began by realizing very early on that I couldn't write this book in the way that I'd written other projects, other, other book projects. Um, I mean, my background is an art historian or somebody who writes on, on the visual arts. Um, um, and uh, I couldn't really deploy some of the methodologies I'd used in, uh, to write about, uh, uh, you know, to do art history projects because there wasn't specific visual artworks that I was going to kind of organize my uh, uh, research around. Um, I knew there were certain bands that I wanted uh, to write about, which I've already uh, enumerated, but it wasn't just writing about those bands and, and, and the music that they made. I was, I think my real subject was the were the conditions of possibility that birthed those bands, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to write about that. And uh, and how do you write about uh, the history of art education, or, or or let's say the particular conjuncture of art educational possibilities in a particular northern English city scene like Leeds, which is largely overlooked, and which I s soon discovered. Um, there is very little in the you know, in the respective you know university archives, uh, especially about the bands, because the band activity was extracurricular at best, right? So um, nobody had even thought at the time to uh, to kind of you know, think of posterity and to, to 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 kind of save material and document the activities of these students uh, who are starting to make music so it just it wasn't there in the archive so i knew that the oral history was going to play a really really important part in this project in a way that it hadn't in, in any previous projects i've done oral history stuff before in a actually in a film project um that uh, i did but nothing to this extent so i ended up uh, taking oral histories from nearly 90 people that's nine zero um uh in order to get um their recollections about um the experience of being at art school and it wasn't just the members of those bands i i interviewed other students who who didn't end up necessarily making music um and i also interviewed any surviving uh tutors and some other important figures from other um kind of walks of life in the city uh, and that became really important as well, because I realised that uh, although I'm writing about the uh, what you might call the art school scene, it was very, very important to see how the people who uh, kind of made up that scene were busy trying to leave it or were busy trying to connect with others in other scenes, in other walks of life both in the city of Leeds and, and elsewhere. So it was really about those kind of networks and, 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 uh, and forms of connection that I had to, to trace. And the only way to trace that was by speaking to these people um, at first hand. And happily, um, almost everybody, there was one key exception, almost everyone who I approached to, uh, to interview uh, agreed uh, and um, and I was really heartened by the degree to which not only were people eager to share their stories, um, but they were also excited about there being someone for the first time who was going to, to write about this scene. So that I got the sense that they thought there was a book here, that there was a book to be written about this scene. As it turned out, 
not the book I'd originally intended, <laughs> um, as, as I discovered as I began to talk to more and more people. Um, but really, that's how I initially went about doing the research. And, and I think it was the excitement of my interviewees that kind of carried me along and buoyed me along. Um, and obviously you speak to one person and they suggest, oh, you should speak to this person or yeah, they'll give you the, um, the, you know, the email address or sometimes actually old school um, telephone number uh, in order to track some people down. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that's that's it, it kind of threw me into oral history in a way that I that I hadn't really anticipated at the outset, because, you know, the only template I've got was Frith and Horn's uh, Art into Pop. Yeah, I mean, there's the John A. Walker book, the crossovers book as well, but there's there's not that much. Surprisingly, given how much we think we know about art school pop, surprisingly, there's relatively little in terms of, uh, or, or certainly there was when I began the project ten years ago now. Um, yeah. So, what was the you talked about um, having kind of a certain idea of what the book would look like or what what it would kind of feel like? But but actually producing something quite different uh, than 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 you kind of anticipated. What were the what were the kind of left turns, if you like, that the book took or the project took? I suppose there was two key turns. First one was that initially I thought this was a book about artist groups, and not only artist groups that made music together, but also artist groups that made performance art together, uh, that made, um, that uh, involved a, a group that was a curatorial collective. I'm thinking of the feminist um, photography project Pavilion that came out of Leeds in the early eighties, as it turned out just after I closed this book in 81. Um, so it was meant to be uh, a study about how, uh, art education, which is typically an individually oriented practice, um, you know, kind of training, as it were, creative individuals, artists, um, uh, how kind of paradoxical it was that between the, between the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and the mid 80s, it had birthed this whole succession in Leeds of these uh, kind of self-organizing groups in various ways, which were kind of variously based on principles of kind of mutual aid and collectivity, collectivism, et cetera. Um, and then I tried to write that book. <laughs> and uh, it was difficult to hold it together. It was even more difficult to imagine who my readers would be. Um, and uh, so it did become much more tightly bound, both historically, it began to shrink, the historical window shrank to what it is now pretty much, uh, 1974 to 1981. And so all the, some of those other things like the performance art groups uh, in Leeds Polytechnic in the early 70s kind of dropped out the frame. And likewise, uh, the, the feminist um, uh, pavilion project and also some of the early black art that came out of, uh, of both institutions in the early 80s also dropped out of the project, but I'm writing that up now as a, as a, as a, as a, as a standalone article. So that, that changed <laughs> quite markedly, but I suppose the rudest <laughs> um, awakening I, I had in speaking to my interviewees was that there I was looking back to the 70s and to, and to, the, and to the, the system of art education then, um, no fees to pay, uh, maintenance grants to be had from local education authorities, which basically paid for, for, for students to, to live while they were studying. Students could also claim housing benefit, uh, uh, could um, uh, even claim the dole if they were canny enough, unemployment benefit during the summer holidays. Um, uh, so I was looking back thinking, you know, probably with rose tinted spectacles in retrospect, um, thinking that there, there was this kind of state funded system. Um, there were no materials yet you had to pay for as an art student. And I was taken aback by the a kind of leitmotif in my uh, interviewees 
testimony, which was, I guess, generally speaking, a leitmotif of disappointment or disillusionment with the art education and the experience of art education at the time. Uh, even though people agreed that there was a book to be written about this period, some of them thought that the kind of scene that they ended up being part of was as much despite <laughs> their experience yeah. of art education as it was uh, enabled by it or, or because of it. And I kind of had to take that seriously, um, that there was, there was something going on uh, in art education, not just in Leeds, I think nationally, um, uh, where it was in, the, the system itself was in crisis and there was a kind of, uh, a kind of really very quickly developing um, kind of collective uh, loss or lack of faith about the project of art education as it had been um, uh, run since the, since the early 60s, the Coldstream system. So it, it kind of ended up a bit shifting towards that. Yeah. It was about, you know, how did all this popular music making activity uh, not only come out of this, this conjuncture, mm. but also perhaps that was the answer in some ways to what was seen to be the problem uh, of art education at, 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 in the mid seventies. Because I mean, I mean, forming a band, um, getting into kind of popular music, or setting up a kind of feminist uh, photography collective—they're all kind of pulling away from the institution. Um, so there is that 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 kind of element to it. But but also, I wonder if if you know if you throw contingency in here. Um, you know, England, Wales, particularly, uh, particularly kind of England, had an enormous number of art colleges. You, you know, you it was very easy to see um, an art education around. There wasn't a, a kind of music education to be had. There wasn't, I mean, now you'd look and you see all these uh, kind of music colleges where you can go and do study kind of production or, or study a whole load of, uh, of different things. So, so, the, so the art college is a, is a space for kind of potentiality perhaps as much as for a kind of dedication to a kind of, kind of art college experience or an art college education. Maybe, maybe there's a difference between an art college education and an art college experience. Um, but I was, one of the things I was particularly thinking about as I was kind of rereading uh, some of this book today, was just about when we're thinking about the condition of possibility for something, you know, we're thinking about how kind of ideas are kind of circulating. Um, and I was thinking particularly about, you know, how you kind of connect, for instance, Gavin talks particularly about uh, a, a writer, TJ Clark, who was teaching in the Leeds University uh, Fine Art Department in the art history uh, bit, um, and how he's a kind of ex-international situationist, um, you know, thrown out of the uh, SI, of course, as every, everyone was. <laughs> um, but you didn't need to go to uh, Leeds University to get that, to get that kind of society of the spectacle. I mean, it was being written about, you know, there was, I think there was a special issue of New Musical Express dedicated to the Situationists. There was a, uh, there was a, a, an alternative bookshop in Leeds uh, where they gave away pamphlets of this um, uh, uh, SI pamphlet called The Poverty of Student Life. Um, so, so, so in a way I was thinking about, you know, one of the things about kind of, um, um, you know, when we're thinking about the conditions of possibility, you've got this these kind of two institutions um, that that uh, are kind of you know producing very very different kind of critical spaces, if you like, for people to kind of rail against, but also to get inspired by. But also, you've got a, this this bigger sense of um, kind of cultural infrastructure. Of things like the musical press, uh, of kind of alternative bookshops, I was just thinking, you know, how these, how how we kind of 
when we when we're trying to map a conjuncture that kind of allows something to happen or, or a set of forces that kind of allow something to happen how do we kind of map these these kind of quite specific spaces like an art college to these you know networks of kind of books ideas magazines you know how do they all come together uh in a very complex fashion is the short answer to, to that but there's so much in what you just said Ben I'll pick up on a few things and I will answer that question directly the first thing about there being a lot of art colleges across across the UK is a really important point um, uh, uh, and of course Leeds had uh, rather more than most because it also had um, a third art college um, which was by this stage, I think, called the Jacob Kramer College, which uh, which um, was housed in, uh, confusingly, in what was once the Leeds College of Art, <laughs> right? Um, but you have a medium-sized city, Leeds, it's not massive by international standards, about 700,000 population or thereabouts, but you've got three art colleges in it. and and But what makes Leeds, if you like to talk about contingency, what makes Leeds particular and I think, and germane to this moment that I uh, tell the story of, is the fact that you've got two um, radical institutions, but differently radical, the Polytechnic being like immersed in, in the avant-garde and especially kind of the historical avant-garde of the early 20th century. And, and then it, Jeff Nuttall's appointed there in 1970, the author of Bomb Culture. So it, the, the avant-garde is given a bit of a countercultural uh, kind of twist, if you like, and, and it becomes the uh, uh, art college at that time that's associated with the avant-garde and probably the only one that's associated at that time with performance art. Um, and then it just so happens that in 1976, T.J. Clark, the social historian of art, gets appointed at the university and then brings about, by his own admission, uh, a kind of ch a, a set of changes that it, uh, it brings about a kind of crashing of gears, he puts it, for the, for the institution, for the Department of Fine Art more narrowly, um, as it lurches towards uh, kind of Marxist and feminist and, and post-conceptual, but Marxist and feminist kind of theory and forms of historical explanation and, and, uh, uh, and, and post-conceptual art. Um, so, uh, so yes, the, there is that conjunction, and, and these two institutions are, are right next to each other. They're either side of the of the inner city ring road. So it means, and this is to get to your start to answer your question, Ben. It means that these institutions are proximate to one another, literally, you know, geographically proximate to one another. And what is between them? Well, there's a ring road but um, it's kind of difficult to meet other students on and, uh, you know, you're just going to get run down, aren't you? Um, but there is also, between these two institutions, a pub, the Fenton, right? And so that becomes a key institution for this scene because it's, it's obviously where some of the cross-institutional, if you like, connection uh, and forms of exchange of ideas and whatnot um, uh, happen in, in the context of that pub, um, which is still there today. Uh, and if you go, it's, it's, it's still, well, I, I was in Leeds in the, in the as, you, as Ben said, in the late 80s, in early 90s, and it looks exactly the same as then. And I've been told by all accounts, it looks exactly the same as it did in the 70s. Um, so, so that, that already begins to, to tell you about how important other institutions and other kinds of spaces, social and otherwise, are, um, you know, part of the ecology, if you like, of this, of this scene, this urban ecology, which then, of course, um, has the light, has the blue touch paper of punk in the shape of the anarchy in the UK tour, rocking up to Leeds Polytechnic in December the 6th, 1976, Sex Pistols, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, The Damned and the Clash, fresh from the, the Sex Pistols, fresh from the, 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 the TV studio in London with uh, Bill Grundy, 
uh, and you know, uh, hot on the heels of their newfound infamy because of all the swearing on telly and whatnot. Um, uh, and that opens up another kind of scene, which is the the, you know, the music scene, and mm. and uh, uh, and punk, of course, it is not just about the music; it's also about a culture, a DIY culture, people doing it for themselves. So no, no, not 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 more than what six months? I think it's less actually. After that gig, not only do most of these these art school bands start forming but you get some of the infrastructure for the post-punk culture you get a club starting at the polytechnic um which then later becomes the f club where all of the punk and post-punk bands play um so uh you know that the art students start to find their place within this newly burgeoning and extremely exciting uh, punk and post-punk culture that is that you know that you know the infrastructure for it is literally springing up all around them and they are also making it um, a, at the same time as as others and with others and that brings non-art school um, personnel if you like into um, into the scene and I think that's that's a marker of how how the the art school influence goes wider than the if you like the the individual art studios or the or the departments the university departments because it's involving um sometimes working class kids who are, haven't even had a uh, you know a kind of higher level education uh let alone an arts school education um yeah. and uh so so yeah so and how you begin to map that well i began to map it through um if you like, um, beginning to literally map people's movements on a huge wall chart. Um, that's what I did. As people told me about key events they were at, like the, like the Anarchy in the UK punk gig, for example, I had key nodes where people came together, um, which then I could see it on uh, visually on, on my wall chart, what were like these kind of key meeting points and these key kind of networks that were being established to kind of help sustain this culture that was that was that was being built by these bands i think um your your use of the word ecology is really useful in in, in what you were thinking about then because i think it is you know trying to to see almost a kind of an ecology of of something kind of emerging of a of a, you, you know and and in your book things like for instance how important cheap housing is or you know cheap space for practicing or for kind of kind of studios i remember going to um in about 81 visiting someone at the the poly and um they all lived in this one row of terraced house housing um in what was about four acres of wasteland uh, in Armley that had just been absolutely kind of leveled and just left this kind of uh, <laughs> street of houses right in the middle of right in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was just a, when you can st start bringing in the actual music and the and the and the sound there. I mean, the, you know, your your book is about the condition of possibility, but it's about the condition of possibility for something something quite specific, um, something sonic, something collective. And I just, um, I mean, going back to uh, TJ Clark again, I mean, because me and Gavin, we both did this um, same course that TJ Clark uh, set up. He'd gone by the time we did it. But, but one of the things there is about, okay, well, there's, you know, you do social history, you, you, you show how, something kind of emerges what, what what was going on in the society uh, but if you're doing the social history of music or if you're doing the social history of art you've got to account for the sensual specificity of this thing you know why did it sound like this why did it look like this and not like something else and um you know clark is really adamant that that you know that 
how do you do? I mean, I guess it's a it's a kind of social formalism. You know, yeah. how do you how do you account for the way this thing sounds? The spluttering, uh, splenetic guitar work of uh, Andy Gill, or you know, against a kind of kind of you know thuddy uh, uh, beat track or or something like that. So how are you how are you kind of getting these? How, how are you getting to speak to getting the context to uh, to to enliven the sound, if you like? That's a great question. Uh, and it's a difficult one, and it's and it's a question that I, I kind of wrangled with and struggled with as, as I was putting this book together. You're absolutely right to to kind of place you know the Clarkian model of social history of art central here, uh, and it is. I wear it lightly, I think, in the book, but it is central to the book uh, as well. And so Clark, which uh, wrote an article in the Times Literary Supplement in 1973 called On the Conditions of Artistic Creation, which I talk about a little bit in, in the book. Um, and, and that's where he kind of sets out his stall for the social history of art and what he thinks the social history of art is good at. Um, uh, and uh, so I wanted to, uh, to kind of use, if you like, the broadly speaking, the approach of the social history of art, but not take the visual artwork as my text, but to, the, the text I'm reading is partly the conditions of, of possibility uh, that we've just been talking about, but then also, as you say, the music and the sounds that, that are made by these bands in, within these kind of conditions that I'm, that I'm trying to, to, to kind of delineate. Um, and I suppose one of the things I wanted to do was to see whether or not for a band like Gang of Four, for example, there was an actual connection at that time between the teachings of TJ Clark and Griselda Pollock and others who had been appoint, newly appointed whilst um, John King and uh, Andy Gill of Gang of Four were students there. And you can imagine my excitement when I was at Andy Gill's uh, apartment and we were going through old files and whatnot. And all of a sudden there's a, a file that flips open and there's all this loose leaf yellowed A4 uh, paper, lots of pages. And it's his, it's his fucking dissertation, you know, from 1979. It's his student dissertation that he's written as it turns out, in a very kind of Clarkian manner of a single painting by the post-impressionist artist Edward Manet, um, uh, Desjardins dans l'Atelier. Um, and so I, I was able to read this dissertation and, um, and then to actually be quite um, surprised by the degree to which there were, for me at least, what I saw as clear resonances between not only some of the themes of, of social alienation, of commodification, et cetera, in, his, in Gill's reading of this Manet painting, but also the kinds of uh, social relations that uh, Gill analyzes in this Manet painting. There's three figures in this Manet painting. I won't go into great detail here. I've got time to do it. But it's, it's in the book, um, you know. But these, uh, he talks about how these three figures are kind of um, fractured in terms of their relations to one another. They kind of don't seem to exist in the same social world. Uh, they're alienated uh, from one another, and it made me think about the relation between the different musical components in the soundscape that is a Gang of Four song and how they were trying to very determinedly, actually Gill and King, create a sound that was, um, uh, that, that the musical elements were, as it were, fractured and didn't, um, didn't uh, sit within a particular generic form of, uh, of musical composition. Um, so uh, so I, that's how I made then connections between uh, 
Gill's art historical analysis and my musical analysis uh, of Ganga 4, and especially at home as a tourist, which was released in the same year as Gill finished his dissertation. And what made me think that I was okay to make that kind of leap from the, from the if you like, the, an analysis of visual form to the, then those guys with Hugo Burnham and Dave Allen making uh, what might be considered to be an analogous um, sonic form was uh, an interview that, that Andy, well, he said some things to me in an interview, which, which kind of helped me. But he, he did a, a, an interview for a podcast called My Favourite Work of Art um, after I'd interviewed him. I think it was in 2019, um, a BBC podcast in which he talked about that painting. Uh, and he talked about how formative it, it was and the ideas of Clark were in shaping the early Gang of Four sound. Um, and so, so that was a very particular, very specific connection there that I thought had not been, nobody had plopped that, nobody yeah. had drawn, drawn out those connections before. I mean, there's some interesting kind of historical work there, I think, because there's a bit in the book where you talk about how they go, how they go to the States in the middle of their course. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, they're look, they're, they're, you know, there's a picture of uh, of one of them uh, next to a Frank Stella painting, uh, and so they're looking at Stella, looking at Jasper Johns, but they're also hearing television play at CBGBs and kind of kind of bands like that. And I mean, you do you, there's not kind of a, a, a kind of sense of necessarily what's going on here, but you could imagine that that actually, you know, television is a lot closer in terms of what you talk about, in terms of the kind of alienated, but also that that kind of, you know, the, the range of things kind of playing on their own terms and not, not necessarily kind of creating a kind of uh, a, a, a seamless entity. You know, you can hear all the different bits kind of working yeah. against each other as working with each other, um, that almost you could, you know, Go and listen to television and 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 actually appreciate Manet much more than Frank Stella on the, <laughs> on, the, on the back of that you know that it actually kind of you know does that kind of jarring work um, yeah uh, I I think I think they got uh, clearly I, I mean my my argument is not like some people have misrepresented it as um, that I'm saying everything about these bands all tracks tracks us back. To I don't know to T.J. Clark's teaching or to what Griselda Pollock said or what well, you know or, or Jeff Nuttall's sort of um, kind of uh, approach uh, you know, and clearly not um, they are drawing from other kinds of resource in order to help if you like their project of musical world making right? yeah um, uh, um, but I think. They, they were, at this stage, of course, art students. Mm -hmm. They were studying art. In fact, it was, of course, the, their study that took them to New York in the first place. It wasn't because they necessarily wanted to go and see what was going on uh, on the New York music scene, um, but it was the, their studies that took them there. Um, I mean, John King went to study the work of Carl Andre, believe it or not, when, uh, uh, when he went to New York in the summer of 76. Um, but um, I think as they became more interested, perhaps, in making music than making art, and that happened to most of them, they began to turn their backs to some degree on making art. Uh, they still had to do it in order to finish their degrees. So they were still making art, but I think they're kind of, if you like, they're, they, they, their hearts were no longer in it, you know. Mm. Um, my argument is they necessarily still carried forward some of the intellectual resources and some of the aesthetic solutions, let's say, that they'd been uh, engaged with and preoccupied with as art students. And they, they but they, they took them elsewhere. They took yeah. them into, 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 into music. Uh, and into a different kind of sociality. Well, that's one of my, that was one of my big arguments in the early part of the book, because it, mm. Why was art, the, if you want, like, why was making avant-garde art um, 
not attractive to uh, this generation of students? Why did stu students who went to study at Leeds because they thought it was the place to study um, uh, the avant-garde, why did they rock up there like Green Gartside, for example, of Scritti Politi, and become instantly disillusioned with what was going on? Um, Kevin Lysette of the Mekons, of course, I tell his story, which is very similar in that regard. And that was because there was no audience, or there was very little audience. The, the early piece of uh, collective performance art that I write about in the book that some members of Mekons and Ganga 4 are involved in had an audience of, uh, the, uh, of about, I think I've counted them, I think there were seven people in the audience because I, uh, John King, um, found a stash of photographs of this performance, more than the three that are in the book. Uh, it, but typically he found them after the book had been published. Mm -hmm. um, so I now have one amazing image of, uh, of the audience with, I think, five or six students on the right hand side and then uh, on the other side of the the seating like that far away tj clark on his own um yeah. and so it was that it, it was the fact that there was that they thought there was no audience so there was no kind of social impact of this thing uh called avant-garde art so um whereas of course they go to the punk gig and it's packed yeah and there's, there's i went to the to see a full gig in Leeds in uh, 82. And there were more people in the band than there were in the audience. But, um, so we've done, we've, we're hit, hitting, um, well, in, in my time, uh, 10, 50, we've done 45 minutes of chat. And I've seen there being kind of, I haven't read um, the comments and things, but I'm, I've seen, you know, texts float by. So shall we uh, open it up for questions? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, thanks so much, Gavin and Ben. And um, we still have time if people want to put more questions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to call on people and ask you to unmute and ask your question. And our first question is from Giannis NYC. Giannis, are you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, uh, my question had to do with um, uh, when you try to do oral histories and you do interviews and you do multiple people who were on the same scene, quite often you will encounter inconsistencies, conflicts, and I was curious, how do you handle this? Do you parse them out? Do you follow up? And how arduous it is to, to disentangle these knots? that appear in oral history projects? It's, thanks, Yanis. It's a very good question. And um, I, I, did, I think I did two key things in, in respect of that. You're right. Um, I encountered a lot of discrepancy um, about how people remembered you know, particular events. Um, uh, the punk gig was one, of course. Uh, some people remembered the Clash is the best band. Others remember, remember the Sex Pistols. Um, there was there was a, there was a, a lot of discrepancy. What I did, I t it, where it was kind of, let's say, date based, or um, where it was a, a discrepancy that I might be able to adjudicate on by reference to archival documentation, to to find a publication that said you know such and such a thing happened on X date, not Y date. I would then. Uh, defer to, to 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 the to the document and uh, however when it was more a matter of interpretation uh, of taste of 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 political sympathies um, I wanted to actually tell the story of those discrepancies and contradictions so brought them into the frame of my analysis and and really that's what I think drove the culture of post punk. Where the, where, where, where the kind of contested, um, uh, was the contested nature of, of the, the post-punk, if you want to call it a counter-public, the post-punk counter-public. There were different kind of political priorities that were being uh, kind of, that were emergent, I guess, and were beginning to be played out, perhaps most notably um, uh, in, in terms of gender politics, 
Um, so there, there's a, there was a real kind of uh, critique, uh, I think, uh, sometimes explicit, other times more implicit within a lot of the, um, the Leeds bands, especially the university bands, um, a critique of the kind of, of cock rock, basically, uh, and, and of the kind of macho theatrics uh, of cock rock. And that was there in Gang of Four, it was there in Mekons, it was there in Delta Five, it was there in bands that, that actually straddled the, 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 the Polytechnic and, uh, and the university bands like Another Colour, who never recorded, and you will have probably never heard of them, uh, well, maybe if you've read my book you will. Um, um, and uh, so, so that kind of, and don't forget that this period, the mid, um, uh, mid to late 70s, to, well, to the early 80s, was the period when the Yorkshire Ripper, the so-called Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, was uh, at large in Leeds. So, um, you know, the, the kind of the, uh, crimes against uh, women, uh, sexual violence, was really uh, kind of um, uh, very present within the everyday culture of, of the city, especially uh, for, for women uh, who walked its streets. Um, so so, so those, those, those politics became really quite pronounced, I'd say, um, as, as the decade wore on. Um, and there were others who were perhaps less kind of fellow travelers of, of, of feminism, but most of the bands that I write about were feminist identified uh, at, 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 the, at the very least. Um, and then there was also all of the um, kind of important uh, politics around, around, uh, around Rock Against Racism, um, which, the, which the bands were also uh, involved in. Um, but I had to tell the story, for example, of how some uh, bands, especially the Polytechnic bands, didn't like some of the university bands and actually thought that uh, the university bands, especially Gang of Four and Mekons, were superior, um, uh, were um, perhaps uh, marked by their um, public school uh, upbringing. They were, most members of these bands were, went to Seven Oaks School before they got to Leeds. So I realized that that was about class politics, you know, and, and, and punk culture uh, uh, was, was a culture that really kind of dramatized and theatricalized perhaps um, uh, the politics of class uh, in, in, in the late 70s. And so all those tensions and discrepancies and, and gripes, minor or major, were all the ways in which kind of class difference, class enmity, the class struggle even, was being played out. And so that, that I had to really uh, give some airtime to. Thank you. Great. Uh, so next we'll hear from Carl Wilson. Hi, um, you've already sort of started answering this in the second half of your last answer, actually. So I was, what I was asking about was the degree to which there were university and poly bands and the ways that they um, were influenced by the different kinds of radicalism of the two institutions. And so you've already started talking about that, but I'd love to hear like a little bit from your map on the wall about who was who and and what we might be familiar with and not familiar with about those divisions. Okay, yeah, I, I think uh, that will allow me to talk a little bit about um, a couple of chapters in the book that often uh, in the conversations like this get overlooked. Uh, and that is the, the last two chapters, the one on Frank Tovey, AKA Fad Gadget, and the final chapter on Soft Cell, because uh, they, um, came from a very different educational um, kind of context to Gang of Four, Mekons, uh, you know, the university context. They came from the Polytechnic. And so it was more the kind of performance art ethos and a very libertarian uh, pedagogy, um, which uh, uh, helped birth, I would say, um, uh, both uh, Fad Gadget, the music of Fad Gadget, um, uh, and, and soft sell. 
Um, and I, I guess the important thing, though, is to say that uh, I think both of those acts were birthed in a critical relation to maybe the macho theatrics uh, uh, of, of, of the avant-garde um, at, at Leeds Poly, especially as it had become developed within the cultures of performance art. So I write a lot in the book about an infamous piece of performance art that a couple of students um, uh, developed uh, um, in 1976, which involved, uh, or rather didn't, depending upon who you spoke to, um, the, the shooting of, of live budgerigars uh, and, and, and mice. Um, and it was a bit of a watershed piece of performance art, watershed insofar as that some people, as it were, um, signed off at that point. Uh, and, but nevertheless, were still interested in avant-garde shock tactics, but wanted to try and find a way of um, um, using shock and taking audiences with them rather than, uh, as it were, shocking them and then, as it, you know, uh, making audiences uh, run, uh, uh, or, 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 or it, as, it, as it happened with with uh, with this piece of performance art, end up in a fight. Um, uh, so out of the poly, you, you get soft cell, you get scritty politi coming out of that. You get um, uh, you get fad gadget, but then you get bands uh, that we uh, that like household name which were a kind of post-punk funk outfit. Um, um, the, the name, household name, um, uh, being of course a bit of a gag um, because they weren't. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Tony Baker, who was uh, one of the members of, of that band, the late Tony Baker, then ended up in more of a kind of Dardar-esque cabaret band uh, thereafter, um, uh, called um, Johnny Jumps the Bandwagon. Um, there are a couple of videos on YouTube of Johnny Jumps the Bandwagon if you want to uh, chase them up. Um, and then uh, I've mentioned the Three Johns. There was a band uh, that was called Sheeny and the Goys that was uh, using the, 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 the derogatory reference to um, a, a Jewish woman and then a, a bunch of uh, genteels. Um, uh, they were a kind of, as I write in the book, they were a kind of mm, manic mixing of uh, the Ramones meet the Shangri-Las. And they were actually quite successful um, at the time on the lead scene. They didn't record neither. Um, oh, I should say, by the way, that one of the great joys of doing this project is I've unearthed a lot of recordings of hitherto unreleased material by almost all of the bands that we've been talking about tonight. And um, I'm happy to say there's going to be a, a double vinyl limited edition um, compilation album that's coming out with Caroline True Records this year uh, of all that material, including unreleased stuff by Gang of Four and, uh, um, and others, but it's, it includes um, uh, some of the Chini and the Goys tracks and, and uh, the band Another Colour, uh, and a pretty amazing post-punk outfit that has some members um, of Three Johns, notably John Hyatt, um, uh, and uh, some members of, of late Delta Five, Jackie Callis, um, they're the two singers, and, and John Diamond, who was briefly a Three John. He was one of the original Johns in the Three Johns before Philip Brennan became, as it were, the fourth John. Um, uh, so, the, the and then there's, there's other bands that were formed by uh, Leeds graduates after they went to other parts of the country. Um, so um, the Cast Iron Theories were, were started uh, with, a, with other people in London. Jane Raleigh um, and Jackie Freeman uh, started the Cast Iron Theories down there. And Ron Crowcroft also made kind of low tech um, electro music um, down in Bognor Regis um, once he graduated from, from, uh, from the poly. Um, and I can't finish my list without mentioning, of course, the Sheehees. 
um, uh, she he's were a, a kind of feminist comedy band, really, um, that in, uh, comprised three um, members: um, Sally Timms, of course, who is uh, now with uh, the Mekons, um, uh, Jackie Fleming, who is now known as a feminist cartoonist. Uh, and Victoria Jackis, who um, was until recently a school teacher, and they um, they m m became well known for singing standards, pop standards like Bobby Vinton's "To Know You Is to Love You," um, Lionel Richie's "Hello," and they'd sing them at in at kind of uh, unbearably in an unbearably high pitch, for example. Um, uh, and they'd have all this kind of musical uh, kind of theatre kind of costuming uh, eyeballs on um, on wires and and that kind of thing. Um, they did, however, write a couple of songs. Uh, one is called, I think Sally wrote it, uh, called uh, I Made Love on the Astro Tour, which is a kind of kooky country number, and that's going to be on the album. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so kind of loads of different types of music, actually. They, they didn't all sound like Gang of Four by any means. As I say, some of them were kind of borrowing from country, from pop, and, uh, and with Bad Gadget and Soft Cell, there was a real kind of investment in electro electronic music, and with Soft Cell in particular, dance music, as that began to, to hit the Leeds Warehouse as American DJs were being brought over in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. Okay, um, our next question is coming from Glenn Hendler. Glenn, if you want to unmute. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, this is sort of a shift in topic, I guess. I was really interested in your discussion of the, the form of forming a band um as a social and political act and that for so many of these leads bands and the mekons are the one i'm most familiar with at least um the goal was to envision re-envision what it meant to form a band and what the shape of bandness looked like um and you probably talk about this more in the in the in the book but can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe just sort of say something about whether it worked um whether you think it worked was it an emphasis that got in the way of the art and the sound or was it something that really enhanced what they were what the bands were doing yeah that's great another great question thank you um yeah this this was at the heart of the project uh, in the first instance and i was um uh, you know it still is at the heart of the project but it was um i was really really interested in um the idea of the commons actually uh, is uh, is how I kind of initially got into thinking about this. The band is a kind of commons, right? Uh, because because with the Mekons, um, the Mekons, the, if you like, the project of the Mekons wasn't just about the members of the Mekons that we see uh, eventually um, photographed for, let's say, for the enemy or for the pages of of sounds, as as Mark White put it to me in interview. He said the Mekons was was also about everybody else. It was also about all the members of the audience. Uh, and in the first uh, iterations of uh, of the Mekons, they would literalize this inclusion through a kind of open mic kind of setup, where they would invite members of the audience to get up on stage and to play their instruments and, and, and to sing and, and to, to basically join them uh, in, the, in this kind of uh, rather um, uh, kind of uh, open, uh, um, open-ended uh, project um, of, of, of popular participation. Um, did it work? Well, in some ways, you might say um, it was bound to fail, right? Um, and uh, this was one of the ways, I mean, the Mekons always talk, they always talk about their failures openly. This is one of the things that I love about the Mekons. I think Sally Timms, when she was recently asked, um, um, what is the secret of the Mekons' success? And rather waggishly, Sally answered not to have any. Um, which I thought was 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 great. Um, so I think that, that what 
it becomes, if you like, what this project becomes is a project that welcomes the collapse of the project, welcomes the 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 kind of the the un the unraveling um, of the radical gesture. When, for example, members of the audience, as Kevin Lysette put it, get onto stage, uh, start strutting like the stars that they're trying to uh, turn their backs on and uh, you know get the microphone and and start singing like Debbie Harry from Blondie or something so so there's a sense in which there's a kind of an, an internal contradiction to the to the project of the Mekons uh, but maybe it was always uh, designed this is the argument I put forward anyway to to demonstrate the limitations of the radical gesture while still insisting on it being an important thing to strive for. So, it, you know, there is a reminder that there are limitations, material social limitations to social revolution, for example, um, and the Mekons remind us about that. At the same time, um, they call for forms of collective action to redress the atomized you know, conditions of, of, uh, of capitalist music consumption that we're all mild, mired in. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Charlie Birch told me that he'd been called away, but it looks like he's still here. Charlie, are you, are you here? Or maybe he left his Zoom on. Um, okay, well, um, I... We'll skip then to uh, Rob Drew. Yeah, I had asked about uh, whether, Gavin, you found uh, some intersections between your work and Grill Marcus's work in Lipstick Traces, which obviously was mainly about the Sex Pistols, but sort of an intellectual history or a secret history um, and brings in uh, the Mekons and some of these other bands. I know that it was through Marcus's work that I discovered the Mekons, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Yeah. And thinking about songs like The Building, that uh, a cappella, let's say, song, which seems to resonate so much with the board, uh, whether you found any... Uh, any uh, intersections between your own work and what Grill, what Marcus has to say about those bands? Most definitely. And I, I, I cite his um, work, his analyses of, of, of the Mekons, unsurprisingly, perhaps, um, but also Delta Five as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, he has some interesting things to say about uh, Delta Five's uh, kind of um, critical um, uh, replaying of the call and response uh, uh, nature of uh, of nineteen sixties uh, pop of the, of the Shangri Las, uh, for example, and so I, I do draw upon his analysis in in a, in a couple of instances, um, uh, and yeah, he, uh, Lipstick Traces is a fantastic project, and it situates uh, you know the Sex Pistols in uh, a kind of historical genealogy uh, of the avant-garde. Um, so I guess where my project, uh, so my project overlaps with his in that regard, but where my project differs is that I'm interested in the, the visual um, art avant-garde as it was mediated by the art school, by the institution of, um, uh, of uh, the institutions of art education and it's that more narrowly that of course um, Grail doesn't talk about and even you know even the best and I include Grail Marcus in this the best music uh, critics and, and scholars who write about this music and this period um, even when they do refer to the impact of art school for example as Simon Reynolds does, perhaps better than most in, in Rip It Up and Start Again, there's a limitation to what they can say because I believe they don't know enough about art education, right? Because they're, they're, they're music journalists or they're, or they're musicologists. So for the most part, 
um, that knowledge uh, is not there. And myself, as a as as a as a visual art scholar, I'm able to bring that um, to the table, and that's what I, I try and do in this book. So that that's how it. So yes, absolutely, uh, Marcus's work is is really important and dovetails with my analysis of some of the bands here. I build upon it, in fact, but also I think there's ways in which um, I do something slightly different to what he's doing in Lipstick Traces. Thank you, it's great. Okay, so we, we still have a little bit of time and um, I think Charlie's question is, is an interesting question. So I think maybe I'll read that out um, for you to answer it, Gavin, and then we'll make that the last question. Okay. So he writes, I'd love to know about the nuts and bolts of communication in the music scene. To what extent were art school channels the means of getting and staying in touch? Or was there a local infrastructure for exchanging news, scheduling, et cetera, that existed entirely apart from those art school channels? Hmm. I would say, I probably need a bit of time to think about this. It's a good question. Now I've not got a ready answer, but I would say that probably the F Club was the was the place. I mean, I've already mentioned the Fenton, for example, what a, a pub, but I think the F Club was a key uh, venue where um, um, students, uh, townies, out of townies, um, kind of came together regularly. It became a bit of a regulars place, and I think people talked inevitably as well as drink, drunk. Um, and I would say that that was uh, a, a key place um, for, for um, kind of not only musical, social connection, political uh, connection, um, but I, I do detail in the book other other contexts like the, the F Club was probably less important, for example, for Soft Cell, whose, um, whose milieu was more a nightclub milieu than a punk rock venue, which was, of course, the Leeds Warehouse. Um, so there were different spaces for different bands, for different kind of sectors uh, within, within this scene. Um, uh, others still um, might have um, gravitated more towards uh, towards political fora, towards the Rock Against Racism Club, um, for example. Um, so they, they they were as you might expect in a city scene. I think the the, the forms of communication were multiple, um, and they were these the, these multiplicity of forms. Uh, existed in the in different social spaces where kind of different people got together i guess probably a bit of a crap answer but that's all i can come up with <laughs> sorry um we did have a couple more questions come come in are you feeling uh you have enough stamina yeah go for it i'm i'm still i'm still all right okay um so uh dan brick uh you need to unmute Oh, do I have to actually ask the question? I oh, thought you just read it for me. Um, uh, it sounds as if the kind of the moment of like 1982 is kind of deliberately out of the scope of your book. But there was that moment where, you know, like I think of Soft Cell and I think of of uh, Scritti and and even even Frank Tovey sort of trying to inject art aesthetics and politics into that new pop. You know, and probably in a little less polished way than, like, say, you know, ABC or the Associates, or like, which are, you know, other, you know, uh, Scottish and I guess Sheffield, right? But um, do you have anything that you'd want to briefly add to? Were you kind of like thinking about that, but you sort of had to like tighten the frame of the book? You feel any of that was successful? Um, did it ultimately align? with kind of some of the social political goals of the kind of earlier, more post-punk sort of angular and less pop styled, mainstream styled uh, groups? Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. Um, I suppose I should say first why I, why I did, you know, kind of narrow the, the, the purview of the book to, and closed it at 1981. And that's because, as I, as I was saying earlier, 
that the subject of the book is in large part the conditions of possibility. Um, and by 81, those conditions of possibility shifted. They began to change. Um, most of these bands that I write about had graduated. Uh, a good number of them had already left Leeds, right? They'd already gone largely to London, but not exclusively. Um, but also things were changing in the art college uh, as well. Um, big things happened outside of the art college. The, um, Peter Sutcliffe was caught in January of 1981, and that set off a massive reckoning uh, about why he was allowed to, to be at large for as long as he was. And so that's when uh, a kind of, you know, the kind of um, uh, agendas of, uh, of kind of feminist critique became, uh, the voices of feminist critique became much louder from, from, from 1981 onwards. And of course, 81 was also the time of the insurrections around the country um, in Toxteth, in, in Brixton, in Chapel Town, in Leeds, uh, around endemic racism across the country. So from that point on, you know, it's really gender and race and the politics of those that becomes um, uh, kind of more strident and more urgent, um, uh, yes, within art college culture, but also more broadly uh, within the culture of the, the city at large. So that's why I closed it at that point. But you're absolutely right, of course, that, that those acts do go on to, uh, to kind of plow a similar furrow to take some of the, the if you like, the, the avant-garde experimentation within popular music in, in slightly different directions when they get to London, when Toby signs to Mute Records uh, as, as Bad Gadget, um, when uh, Soft Cell make the Sex Dwarf video, for example, which I, I only mentioned that in the book, but I, I, I was going to write about that extensively because for, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, that is really a kind of Nuttallian riot, the kind of, you know, Jeff Nuttall style performance art has to shock, it, you know, it has to cause a riot in order to do what it needs to do. And, and that's what was happening with with Sex Dwarf, I, I think, the, and, and the kind of the furore it, 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 it brought about in the, in, in the, in the popular press uh, uh, and whatnot. And, and Scritti, uh, and maybe Yang of Four to some degree, yeah, the new pop direction. Um, did it work? Um, uh, that's that's, that's a, a, a moot point about whether or not the, what by that stage was a more Derridian deconstructive uh, um, kind of iteration of pop, whether or not that the Derridian iterative dimension could be heard by all of the people who became Scritti fans in the new pop period um, uh, in, and thereafter. That's a question, um, as the performance artist David Hoyle might say, I'll leave with you. Okay, and this will be our final question, and it's a very good final question, actually. Um, Alice Boone. Um, thank you, Gus. Um, so at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that you began to write this book as you were thinking about like your own experience, like teaching in an art school. And I wondered um, how that sense of wanting to animate the contradictions of so many of these um, emergent scenes and emergent institutions at the time, how that helps you think about um, the contradictions of like what it means to work in an institution right now, given that we've seen so much collapse in journalism, in real estate, in, in university life, and like who can afford to go to school, who can be, who can teach, um, and in, rec in Brexit itself. So how does like working on the book help you think through those contradictions like in your own experience professionally now? Well, one of the things that I'll answer it negatively, then I'll answer it positively. One of the things that uh, I didn't want it to do in addressing the contemporary shitstorm that we currently um, kind of are experiencing is to say 
it was all so much better back in the day, you know, and this to be some sort of melancholic uh, left nostalgic uh, project um like uh, you know it, it we we were able to kind of imagine a future once world making of you know alternative worlds were once possible in this great state funded art school system we once had and now we're fucked you know i didn't want that to be the conclusion that readers would uh, uh would would make upon reading this book because the book is so much also about if you like the how these people who were students at the time were actually meeting brick walls uh, of their own right um the limitations of their education is what they were tangling with um i think the lesson of the book is 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 different i think the lesson of the book resides in the possibilities of collective action um because uh, it, you know, it's all about how some pe some of these people working with their own disillusionment, with the sense of the poverty of the art education they were going through, and the the increasing rightward turn uh, of uh, of popular politics, of the politics of the street, with the you know the growth of of, of racism uh, in 1970s uh, Britain, um, that they turn to one another in order to uh, create these kind of hope machines um, uh, in, the, in these bands to try and imagine a way out of their institutional and political disillusionment. And I think that is a lesson that is as, as valid and as relevant today as it was in the late 1970s. Great. Thank you so much, Gavin and Ben. Um, it's a wonderful session. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Next week, we have a presentation on two biographies, Timothy Hoover's biography of King Curtis and RJ Smith's biography of Chuck Berry. So please come back for that and uh, have a good night, everyone.